Okay, so let's begin. Uh, thank you very much uh, uh, for coming to this uh, session. And today we have a, a very important uh, algorithm to discuss, which is uh, known as quantum phase estimation. And uh, this algorithm is important because there are a lot of uh, uh, practical problems that are actually addressed using this quantum phase estimation algorithm. And this algorithm uses quantum Fourier transform as well that we studied uh, yesterday. So uh, hopefully uh, with, uh, after learning uh, this algorithm, you will have uh, uh, enough algorithms learned uh, that uh, you can then begin to understand many uh, complicated and advanced algorithms uh, for quantum computing. So let me begin by sharing my screen. Okay, so our task today is quantum phase estimation, and we'll see why uh, this particular name for this algorithm. But this algorithm, you know, uh, let me first say what it does, and then I'll say a little bit about uh, some of its applications before we went on, uh, before we go to actually derive uh, the circuit for this algorithm. So this algorithm essentially is uh, uh, something like this. Let's say you have a unitary uh, operator, some unitary operator, U, uh, and you want to find its eigenvalues. So this quantum phase estimation actually finds eigenvalues of this unitary operator. QPE finds eigenvalues of U. And just so that we know what unitary operator is, if we apply, let's say, unitary operator to some vector psi, what we get is uh, an eigenvalue times that vector if psi is uh, an eigenvector. So uh, with the help of QPE, we can find this k. Some people, you know, use uh, this symbol uh, small u for the eigenvector, and maybe uh, we can la label this eigenvalue as a sub u uh, like this. So it's the same thing. But these unitary operators or unitary matrices have one thing special about them, and that is their eigenvalues uh, have a modulus which is equal to one, which means that their magnitude is one. So uh, we can also write uh, the eigenvalue corresponding to this, you know, uh, we can also write eigenvalue corresponding to eigenvector u, something like this. Let's say iota, theta, you know, sub u, where this, you know, a sub u, I have written it as iota theta sub u. Because this has an eigen uh, magnitude of one, so all num complex numbers with magnitude one can be written as exponential iota something, where this theta, you know, uh, is called phase. So since with this algorithm, we will be able to find this phase theta u, this phase is the phase of this eigenvalue of magnitude one. So essentially, we can find this eigenvalue itself. Uh, by simply you know taking a logarithm from this so that's why this algorithm is called quantum phase estimation and it is important you know in several uh, situations let's say uh, perhaps the most obvious and uh, straightforward application of this one is if you have let's say a quantum system for example you have uh, a hydrogen atom or a helium atom or maybe uh, water molecule and many other quantum mechanical systems, some protein or some, you know, uh, other thing. And all of these quantum mechanical systems, they are characterized by their Hamiltonians. And these Hamiltonians of these quantum mechanical systems, they're actually unitary operators. So by specifying this uh, uh, molecule, we essentially can specify Hamiltonian. So if you want to see 
what is let's say the ground state energy of this water molecule uh, or maybe what is the uh, energy of uh, an, an atom or something else so there these energies are actually very important when we uh, have to study reaction dynamics etc so uh, with this uh, quantum phase estimation algorithm we can find those energies because h when applied to uh, an eigen state psi gives us energy times psi so if we know uh, so this psi is some ground state and uh, uh, in general you know this may not be uh, the eigen uh, state of uh, hamiltonian but, but this can be written as you know uh, a superposition of eigen states of the hamiltonian so we can find these energies uh, for for any given hamiltonian by using this quantum phase estimation algorithm so this is one application another very important application is uh, which is actually Schwarz factoring algorithm. So the uh, the Schwarz factoring algorithm to uh, factor prime numbers is essentially a quantum phase estimation algorithm with a particular unitary operator. So these and maybe there's another, for example, for how to find the discrete logarithm of uh, uh, something that is also a quantum phase estimation algorithm with u defined uh, in a you know special way. So for different applications. The algorithm would remain same, except that this unitary operator would be changing. So today we will, you know, discuss uh, this algorithm for a generic uh, uh, algorithm and maybe another application that, if we have time today, I will discuss uh, right today, which is uh, to find a number of, you know, solution of such problem, not the solutions itself, but the number of solutions. For example, if you have an unstructured database and uh, you want to find uh, some elements that satisfy a particular criteria, we already know how to find those elements using Grover's algorithm, but there's one trouble with that Grover algorithm that we need to know what R is. And R was nothing but N over mu, uh, where N is the total number of elements and mu is the number of uh, solutions our problem. So uh, to run Grover's algorithm, we first need to find this mu, the number of solutions present in the search algorithm, because otherwise we might not be able to rotate it uh, with a specified number of times to shift our state uh, along uh, omega. So with this algorithm, we can actually find this number of solutions uh, of this search problem. And that is actually how uh, a quantum search algorithm works, that you first use a quantum phase estimation to, uh, and this actually has a particular name. This algorithm is called quantum counting with, because it counts the number of solutions in an unstructured uh, data set before even finding the solutions. So uh, uh, an actual quantum search algorithm works uh, in two steps. In the first step, we use a quantum phase estimation or quantum counting algorithm to find the number of solutions. And then we, once we know what this value of R is, we can run Grover's algorithm to actually find those solutions. And there are actually many other uh, applications of this algorithm as well. Okay, so with this uh, motivation for this uh, algorithm, let's, uh, uh, I see there are some comments. Uh, Okay, so uh, let's now discuss this quantum phase algorithm and we will try to do one application as well. So quantum phase estimation. And let me just uh, repeat it again. Let we have a unitary operator U, which is acting on, let's say, one of its uh, eigenvector uj. So it is giving some eigenvalue iota theta j and giving us this eigenvector back. So if you apply this operator to a different eigenvector, you will get a different phase and so on. Uh, so if this is one eigenvector, it is only this. So let's let me now work out for, for a situation where we have our input state prepared in one of the eigenvectors. 
so that uh, the situation less complicated. And then at the end, I will also discuss uh, how this algorithm will work if we uh, don't have our input state prepared as uh, a pure eigenvector state, but maybe a superposition of eigenvectors. Okay, so. I will describe the algorithm and then we'll analyze it. So the algorithm is like this, that we have certain number of, uh, you know, N qubits that are prepared in the zero state. And then we apply Hadamard on each of them. And you know we get uh, a, super, a uniform superposition state. By the way, instead of writing H H H like this, there is another notation for this thing, with that we can just put one block and write you know Hadamard tensor n. So this is essentially the same thing as I was saying before. Okay, so we have these n uh, qubits, and then we have uh, another set of let's say. Uh, some m qubits where we have prepared our state uj on these qubits. So whatever that eigenvector state is, we have to, for now, let's assume that that state is prepared uh, already and it is available in this set of uh, qubit register. So the algorithm is this, that we first apply the unitary operator raised to power two power n minus one, and it is controlled by the top qubit coming out of this Hadamard transform. And then uh, the output of this gate is fed into another unitary gate, which is the, the same unitary operator but now which is being applied u power two power n minus two. And this is controlled by the second qubit. And then this output is fed into another unitary gate, u power two power n minus three. And this is controlled by the third qubit. And we continue it until you know we reach uh, the last qubit. And then we have another controlled operation u power two power zero because n minus n would be two power zero. So this is essentially u and its output is like this. So we have something over here. So let's now see uh, what are these different uh, gates. So all of these are unitary operations, but they are controlled unitary operation. And uh, the, the same state that is fed in here, this would be available right here because this uj is an eigenvector of this unitary operator. And let's just, before you know, I discuss the circuit, let me just discuss what is the uh, result of action of a unitary operator raised to some power. So suppose that we have, uh, we know this thing that when we apply this u to some eigenstate uj, we get exponential iota theta sub j and uj back. But if we apply this unitary operator some x number of times to this gate, we can see it easily that let's say this x is 10. So I can apply it one by one to this state. So this x minus one is here and then this u is separated out one, one u. And this one unitary on this uh, eigenvector will give us exponential iota theta j. And what is left are x minus one unitaries to be applied. And then uh, we apply another unitary uh, uh, on this uh, state and we get another exponential iota theta j. So this would become exponential iota theta j times two because there are going to be two. So two theta j x minus two uj. And if you continue like this, you can see that the end result of applying 
this unity operator x number of times is essentially giving us iota x theta j uj. So basically, this power x just uh, comes in the uh, in product in the exponential for this phase. So just to give you an example, if you apply a unitary operator three times, this essentially means iota three theta j uj on uj, and so on. So it means that when we are applying this unitary operator uh, two power n minus one times, this essentially is giving us uh, this uj vector right here again, but with the, uh, the with the phase factor exponential iota uh, two power n minus one into theta and so on. So that's why this state uj is available all the way up here, but there are phases uh, that are uh, being present at different states. All right, so let's now see how the total circuit works as a whole. So at the starting point, at this point, we have a state like this. So this is our starting point. We have this state zero and we have this state uj. And then, and this by the way, I, I can write like this as well, zero, zero. So this essentially means this thing. Okay, or some people would, you know, just write it zero uj. And this zero means that this is uh, uh, an n qubit zero. Okay, when this state passes through the first part of this circuit, which is this uh, Hadamard on this zero state, nothing on the uj state, we will get uh, something like this, h star n on this zero state uj. So this time, instead of writing it out as a, as a formula that we uh, you know, are used to, let's you know, just write it in an expanded form. We have, so, so this essentially is this one over two square root power n. The first qubit is zero, one. The second qubit is again zero plus one, all the way to the last qubit in zero plus one state. And I have taken there over under root two outside over here. And then at the end, I have this uj state. So this is, this part is essentially this output here because Hadamard on each zero qubit will give us plus state here, plus state here, plus state here, all the way to here. And on the other side, I still have this uj state. Now let's see how this first unitary operation works. So this operation is essentially applied only on uj, but it's being controlled by this qubit. Okay, so, so the first operation is controlled by this qubit and it's going to be applied on this thing. So let me first, you know, just uh, discuss what would happen if I have these qubits, just, you know, uh, only these qubits in my circuits. So this is nothing but zero uj plus one uj. And since uh, I'm not going to apply a, a controlled gate on this system, so this is the control bit, this is in zero state. So nothing happens to this. So this remains in this state, but this control bit is in one state. So there is a, uh, an operator u power two power n minus one being applied to this uj. So this is equal to zero uj plus one. And this is nothing but exponential iota theta j two power n minus one because this is this operator is being applied two power n minus one times on uj and uj will be back over here again but i can take uj common out again so i'm left with zero exponential iota uh, theta j into two power n minus one one and the uj gets out okay so this is after passing through this stage, 
our output, our qubits would now be like this. So after passing through this and this operation, this would change to this thing. One over two square root. So the first qubit raised to power n. The first qubit is now changed to exponential iota theta j to power n minus one, one. The second qubit is still zero plus one. The third qubit is zero plus one. And the last qubit is still zero plus one into uj. So this is what happened after we are here. Now, when we go from here to here, so this is a controlled operation with respect to this thing. So this qubit will now be affected, the second qubit. But now this is controlling an operation with u power u raised to power only two power n minus two. So now when this thing, this qubit controls an operation on this one, this will gather a phase and our output would be zero plus sequential theta j two power n minus one one zero plus exponential iota theta j two power n minus two one and the all other qubits are still in zero plus one state but when they also pass through successively all those unitary operation then the next qubit would be zero plus exponential iota theta j two power n minus three one and so on all the way to the second last qubit would be zero plus exponential iota theta j two one and the last qubit would be zero plus exponential iota theta j and uj is still there so this is what we will get after passing through this circuit that I have shown, this part. So let's see uh, what this output looks like. Remember, our goal is to find this theta j. We are trying to find this theta j. That is our goal. And it is appearing, you know, in all of these qubits over here. Okay, so if we uh, look closely at this state that I have written in front of you, this actually matches exactly uh, the output of uh, a Fourier transform with, you know, little bit of variation. If you recall our, uh, let me see from our yesterday's lecture that we had our QFT written in a uh, certain way. Like this. If you recall, we had the QFT part. Our QFT was one over two square root power n into zero plus exponential two pi iota j over two one and zero plus exponential two pi iota j to power two one all the way to zero plus two pi iota j over two n so if i compare this thing this is essentially the same thing that is written on the top the only thing that i have to do is let's say I, uh, if, if, if we identify this, this is iota and the iota is here. And then if we identify our theta j into two n with two pi j, then it's the same thing because out of this two n minus one, I can keep two n here and, uh, and take the two power minus one separate and this becomes one over two. Over here, 
this is 2 power uh, minus 2. So this comes here 2 power 2. So if we just identify the J of Fourier transform with uh, actually 2 pi J of Fourier transform with theta J into 2 N, this is exactly the Fourier transform. So it means that if I now have an inverse Fourier transform over here, then my output would be something like this. So when I take the inverse Fourier transform of this thing, I get J, right? J state. But if I take Fourier transform of this thing, the, the inverse Fourier transform that what we have written on top, what we should get is since J is now equal to theta J 2 N over 2 pi. So it means our output state over here would be theta J 2 power N over 2 pi. So let me just put a state sign, which means that my output is now theta j 2 power n 2 pi, which also means that if I have to compute theta j, all I have to do is from the whatever the is the output state is, I divide output, uh, you know, by 2 power n and multiply it with 2 pi, and I will get my phase. And you see, this also makes sure that my phase is always between 0 and 2 pi, because this output, this state will be, you know, if this is an n bit state, this number is never going to be greater than 2 power n. Okay, so for example, if this is a, a 3 bit state, for 3 bit, maximum magnitude of this state is when this is 1, 1, 1, which corresponds to 7. And this 2 power n for 3 bit would be 2 power 3, 8. So this number is always less than 2 power n. So this number is less than 1, always. So this is between 0 and 1. So when I multiply with 2 pi, my phase that we get is always between 0 and 2 pi, which covers the whole spectrum for the unitary operator. OK, so people who develop this algorithm, they essentially work backward uh, from the Fourier transform. They knew what the Fourier transform uh, looks like. So they designed, uh, you know, this part of the circuit to match its output, you know, uh, to the Fourier transform. That's why they started out with this, you know, weird u power 2n minus 1, u power 2n power n minus 2, and so on. Because with this thing, you can end up uh, with an output that matches the Fourier transform. And then you just take inverse Fourier transform to, to measure the, you know, this state, which in this case corresponds to theta j 2 power n over 2 pi. And from there, we can find out the phase. Any question regarding this algorithm? If not, let me show the Kiskat implementation for this, uh, you know, circuit. Let's uh, stop sharing this one and let me share my screen. Okay. So I have already, you know, sent this notebook to you so you can open it. This is a, a lecture eight notebook. All right, so we start, you know, over here that uh, we import. So for this one, I'm not using my own QFT, even though I can easily use the QFT circuit that I show, uh, shared with you yesterday. But I'm just using this command QFT, which is already implemented in this Kiskat uh, module. So I will use that for QFT and IQFT. And then I'm going to use, uh, you know, these new uh, things called operator because I'm going to build uh, uh, an artificial unitary operator because I'm not talking about any particular example right now. I'm just focusing on the uh, on this uh, circuit. So for that, uh, I'm just, you know, uh, building an artificial unitary operator. 
which is uh, going to be a simple thing. Okay, so with this, let me run it. And then I have this, you know, uh, initialize qubit part, which, uh, which is a function now. And all it does is uh, 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 that these measurement qubits that we call, so this, these, uh, you know, these qubits, so this set of qubits, uh, I'm labeling as measurement qubits, because this is the one where, which we are going to measure at the end. And this set of uh, qubits is sometimes called working qubits or MCDF qubits uh, for preparing the eigenvector uj. So, you know, this initialize qubit function, uh, whatever, whatever circuit I give it, it uh, and measurement qubits, and these the, the other one are the target qubits that I'm not doing anything right now. So these measurement qubits, I just, you know, apply a uh, head MR to each qubit. Just the initial head MR that we have uh, over here. Okay, so let me execute this function so that it is saved when I have to use it. And then I'm preparing a unitary operator as just a simple exponent operator, okay? Because it all, all it does, it apply a control unitary operator uh, with a specified phase already because I have defined it, you know, this control unitary operator is, uh, let me just discuss what it is. So let's say I have, you know, uh, a single qubit and uh, I just apply and a phase shift to it that I, I multiply it with something like two pi iota theta and I get something. And then I have another qubit, which I can call a control qubit. And this is, you know, some target qubit. So this gate QU1 that I'm using, this just, you know, uh, applies this, uh, you know, uh, phase to this qubit when this control qubit is one. If you want to, uh, think in terms of matrix, this gate is just exponential two pi iota theta zero zero. So this is, you know, the simplest unitary operator that I have worked that I can easily specify its theta already what I want. And since this is, you know, uh, a diagonal uh, matrix, uh, its eigenvectors, uh, you know, uh, can also be written as one zero and zero one. So they're simple eigenvectors that we can prepare. So this is the a uh, unitary operator that I'm going to use uh, for my control unitary operation. And this also has an advantage that if I want to build an operator of let's say u power some m, this u power m is nothing but one zero zero exponential two pi iota m theta. So this is my u raised to some power operator and this is my u raised to power one operator. Actually at the end, I, I will just use only this one. Because when I, when I use M1, I can get U out of it uh, back again. So this is my unitary operator uh, as an exponent operator. So let's use it. And then this is, uh, and this takes it as input, uh, the circuit that I'm going to apply it, then control qubits, target qubit, theta, and exponent. So this exponent is that M that I was talking about. I can select the value of M uh, to make a required unitary operator. Then I'm defining the supply inverse quantum Fourier transform uh, thing. This is just, you know, uh, if within this function, either you can uh, build your own Fourier transform or just use, uh, you know, this QFT command from the Kiskat library that I imported over here. So I'm just using that. So this QFT works on uh, n qubits and I'm applying its inverse, not the uh, direct QFT because we need inverse QFT on the qubits that we need, we will have to supply those qubits over here. So this is a function number six uh, in input six that you know uh, works uh, as an inverse QFT. Now here is my quantum phase estimation program. And you can see it takes N as the number of qubit and it takes theta that I can specify. This theta is, you know, the phase that we are trying to compute. So let's say we, have a quantum circuit of n plus one qubit. I need n plus one because this one qubit I'm using for control unitary operation. So in this case, my uh, unitary is uh, only uh, single qubit. 
because I'm uh, applying a single qubit filtry here, controlled by all the top n qubits. Now, at the first, we have to initialize our circuit. And this initialization, if you recall, this is just the Hadamard gates on all the n qubits. And then we have to apply those controlled unitary gate with specified power. So you see uh, for x in range n, so range n mean I go from zero to n minus one. And uh, uh, I'm defining this exponent as two power in uh, Python. Remember power is defined by double star, two power n minus x minus one. Uh, so for x is equal to zero, this power would be n minus one, which is the first uh, power that we need. And uh, similarly for x1, this power would be n minus two and so on. So here I'm now using those unitary operator control, control unitary operator, because they are just, you know, these uh, CU1 gate uh, controlled by the control qubit and applied to the target qubit. So target qubit is that n plus first qubit, which is, you know, uh, fixed here. So this is n. So remember, when I have uh, constructed an n qubit circuit, my labeling is zero to n minus one. And when I have constructed an n plus one circuit, my labeling is from zero to n. So this nth qubit is actually the last qubit which is working uh, for operation uh, by the unitary operator. And then we can specify theta and this exponent is just, you know, uh, this thing which is coming from, and X is the, you know, the controlling qubit because first x is zero, top qubit, then x1, and so on. At the end, we have this inverse uh, QFT, and then we do all this by elements. And now you see I'm calling this program uh, with n is equal to five qubit, and I'm specifying arbitrary theta, let's say theta is 0 0.9, and my circuit is QPE program and theta, and Let's say we draw it in text form, but let's just use MPL. That would be better. MPL. Okay. All right. So here is the circuit. You see the Hadamards on all first four qubits, then control unity operation. So since these are user defined control unity operation, there's no symbol in Qiskit. It just draws, you know, these two lines. Uh, so this Q5 is where we have to prepare our eigenvector. And remember when, when we haven't done anything to Q5 so far. So it means Q5 is initialized to zero. So that zero state is also an eigenvector of the control unity operation. The other eigenvector is the one state. Okay, so this is the IQFT that we have applied and then these are the measurements. So let's run the cost simulator. And you see, I measured this, uh, uh, zero, zero, zero state, which means that uh, with one probability, let's see, and here, so this is just a command that we will sometime need when there is, uh, you know, a lot of histograms over here, and you can see which one you want to get, so you can use this uh, to find the maximum one. So here there's only one, so it will be the zero, zero, one that is coming out. Anyway, and then, so this is the zero, zero, zero. And this theta that is, we can measure this theta by, uh, by dividing it with two over n. So this time I'm not multiplying with two pi because uh, I have defined my phase to be already two pi iota theta, not as iota theta. So that's why two pi is uh, missing. So all I have to do is convert this state 0, 0, 0 into the integer number. And in the, because this number is given in base two. So this is what I'm specifying that this highest probability outcome is in base two and convert it into integer state and then divide it by two power n. So this is my Mayer theta. So something has gone wrong in the circuit. Let me, you know, go back here. Okay, so this quantum circuit.cu1 method is depressed, depreciated as of 16. It will be removed no earlier than. Okay, so this is not that is not. So let's execute it again. So 
Okay. Just giving the zero zero state again. Okay, so there's something wrong with this circuit, which uh, you can't see, let's say. Okay, so let's, oh, this part was missing. I have to initialize my n plus first qubit as well in the zero one state, which is the eigenvector state. This one, well, let's say if we do it to one zero, that is the one state. Okay, so now we see that it seems to be working the way it should. So we had, you know, uh, this uh, uh, theta that we initialized 2.5 and we measured it to 0 0.5. So this unitary operator that we were talking about, this one, this actually has two eigenvectors, 1, 0 and 0, 1. And the uh, zero one eigenvector, which represents the uh, zero qubit state, this actually has uh, an eigenvalue of uh, uh, one, which means that this corresponds to exponential iota zero. And this one has eigenvalue iota two pi iota m theta. So since you know, uh, this, this is already diagonal. So you can al already see that this is the first eigenvalue. This is the second eigenvalue. So when I measure this eigenvalue, I should get zero. When I measure this eigenvalue, I should get theta. And this eigenvalue corresponds to uh, eigenvector uh, 0, 1, or 1, 0. Let me, you can check. Okay, so it's going to be here. So this P is, you know, the, the input state. And uh, when we apply this phase, so if this T is in one state, this phase gets applied. And when this T is in zero state, the phase gets applied, but the eigenvectors are going to be formed from here. So uh, you can check that one eigenvalue is one, the other eigenvalue is two pi iota theta, which means that uh, one uh, with one initialization, the, the zero one initialization, we get zero. And with the one zero initialization, we get one. So for one zero, we got this thing. And remember, the uh, the phase is coming from the index of this thing. It's not coming from this probability that we are seeing. Because as we saw uh, in the notes, that at the end, the state, when we take inverse Fourier transform, our output state is this one. Which means that our state is, uh, our phase is in the index. It's not in the amplitude of this state. So that's why, we have to convert the index into an integer. And then from that integer, we, we get this theta j out. Okay, so we, we can check with some other thing. Let's say n is five and this is, you know, phase is some seven. Now you see that in histogram, I have, you know, uh, several things here. So I'm going to pick up this state with the highest probability using this command. So this state is one zero one 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 zero, and so I specified zero point seven, and I am able to measure zero point six nine. And I can increase this measurement accuracy by increasing the number of working qubit n, because when I have high higher number of n qubits, I I get uh, you know. Uh, a better spread of state so I can access an index which is closer to 0 0.7.
Okay, any question regarding this phase algorithm? If not, let me now discuss what is uh, called the quantum counting algorithm, which is one application of the quantum phase algorithm. So in quantum counting algorithm, our goal is to count the number of solutions uh, that uh, can be found using the Grover search algorithm. So essentially we are trying to uh, say that if we have a database of some elements which are equal to n so total number of elements are n which is 2 power n where uh, small n is the number of uh, qubits that are needed to compute uh, this n and suppose there are mu number of solutions of our problem so this r depends on n over mu so that's why we need to find uh, this mu to be able to know how many times the grover iteration has to be done and just to you know remind you that the grover algorithm was something like this that you have n qubit initialized to zero state you first performed n had a merge of n and then you performed uh, a phase oracle uf that uh, you know give a minus sign to those indexes which are the solution of the search problem and then we have and had a merge and a special phase oracle uf naught and then i had a mart again and then we repeated this thing r times and after that we had this you know measurements and the index of the you know measurements uh, uh, gave us the, the solution of this uh, problem so this operator that is you know in this one we can call it grover operator or operator or g operator and if you remember the state at this point was written as s state cosine theta by 2 w perpendicular plus sine theta by 2 w and when when we applied this grover operator to this s state we got this thing that the state went to theta plus theta by 2 w perpendicular plus sine of theta plus theta by 2 w so if you recall the, that pictorial arrangement so this is our uh, solution axis and this is the perpendicular to that so we start from here theta by 2 and we keep rotating by theta in this direction and we have to know how many times do we have to rotate so that we stop close to this axis instead of keep keep on going okay so if you look closely at this output we can easily see that this g is nothing but a rotation operator so i can also write this g as cosine theta minus sine theta sine theta cosine theta in this w perpendicular w basis so if you apply it to you know this vector cosine theta by 2 sine theta by 2 you can again work out that you will uh, the top row will correspond to this thing and the bottom row will correspond to this number so this g is a rotation operator so fortunately this g is a unitary operator because this is a rotation operator this is a unitary operator it preserves the magnitude of the vector only changes its direction or phase so to say so it means that i can use this g operator uh, in uh, uh, the quantum phase estimation algorithm to find its eigenvalues but let's see what those eigenvalues you know uh, correspond to what are the eigenvalues of this grover operator so this g operator if you can easily find their eigenvalues and eigenvectors by you know uh, noting this thing that it has eigenvectors i'm not going to do this computation and i hope that you can all do so the eigenvectors of this grover operators are iota one and the second eigenvector is minus iota one 
and the uh, eigenvalue corresponding to this eigenvector is uh, exponential iota theta and eigenvalue corresponding to this is exponential minus iota theta which we can also write iota 2 pi minus theta so if theta is between 0 to 2 pi this is uh, also a number between 0 to 2 pi so it means that this grover operator has uh, uh, two eigenvector and two eigenvalues and even if it, it doesn't matter which eigenvalue we find whether we find this one or this one we will be able to find theta so the eigenvalues of grover operator will tell us theta directly and we can recall that sine theta by 2 is nothing but n over mu square root so once we know uh, theta we can know mu immediately because n is known the total number of items in the such space they are known so by estimating this theta we can find uh, this mu but before i you know implement uh, grover algorithm let me now go back and discuss another important point which is related to grover algorithm again so here we started by saying that we have been uh, initial, we have initialized our input state as a single eigenvector of the state uh, of this uh, unitary operator u but what if we either cannot uh, initialize our input state in an eigenvector or maybe we might not even know the eigenvector of a given uh, of unitary operator that we want to you know operate or maybe we deliberately want to have a situation where our input state is not an eigenvector but it is you know a state that may contain more than one eigenvector so instead of uj let's say uh, we have input state psi as some sum of cj uj where j goes from one to maybe let's say mu so psi doesn't may not have all the eigenvector but might have you know some eigenvector of this eigen uh, of this unitary operator u so in this case when i apply this u and psi i get sum over j from one to mu uh, cj exponential iota theta j uj so i get this sum so you can work out in a similar way that if the input is the superposition of uj's and since all of these you know operations are linear they are unitary operations so this will tra transform you know the uh, combined output state that was here uh, something like uh, theta j 2 and 2 pi uj instead of getting this output state what we will get would be a combination of cj theta j 2 power n over 2 pi into uj so we will have a linear you know superposition and when we do measurement on this one it will you know collapse uh, uh, to one of the states uh, u so which means that at the end our measurement would be something like c j modulus square corresponding to this you know uj state and uh, the this index you know corresponding to let's say this theta j 2 power n over 2 pi uj so now since j could be more than uh, something we would be getting something like this so in instead of getting only one uh, uh, chart one bar in the histogram we might be getting you know let's say several uh, bars in the histogram so maybe this corresponds to one zero one state this could be one 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 and this could be zero zero one and their relative probabilities will be proportional to let's say this is uh, proportional to uh, c1 
mod square and this is proportion to c2 mod square and this is proportion to c3 mod square so in the input state if there are if there is a superposition of three eigen vectors we should be getting three histograms each corresponding to one of these states because for each of these states there is a probability cj square of its coming so it means we can either measure this state so if we measure you know this state with this probability we can see that the phase corresponding to this thing would be uh, you know the integer you have to convert this index into integer so let's say that is something uh, integer 101 and you have to divide it with 2n and multiply it with 2 pi so this is the phase of the first eigen value corresponding to first eigen vector and then for the second eigen vector you uh, will uh, to find the phase of the eigen value of the second eigen vector you convert this one into integer and then multiply with the 2 pi divided by 2 n and similarly for this so it means that uh, this uh, phase algorithm not only you know works uh, for, uh, uh, for 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 the situation when at the input we have you know only uh, one cube uh, one eigen vector but if we have uh, a superposition of more than one eigenvectors, our output will also have that many uh, histograms. And uh, from this, we can, you know, find uh, this, you know, uh, the phases of each one of them. And uh, from these phases, uh, you know, uh, we can do whatever we want. So if we come back to this, you know, Grover algorithm again, so it first of all means that I don't have to initialize my input state now to either this eigenvector or this eigenvector. What I can actually do, I can just initialize my input state of the uh, uh, algorithm for the quantum counting to just S, because S contains uh, X, S is a superposition of both of these states. So S is a superposition of both of these, which means that when we uh, run this algorithm at the output, we will have uh, two histogram, uh, two bars in the histogram, and each bar, uh, one bar will give us theta, the other bar will give us two pi minus theta, and uh, from this we will know what theta is. So we don't even have to prepare our input state to this one of these eigenvectors. So the circuit for quantum counting is like this, that I have these n qubits, initialize to zero state and then I apply Hadamard to each one. We call it Hadamard transform. And then I have, you know, these lines coming out of it. And then I have uh, uh, this S state prepared over here. I start from zero and then I apply a Hadamard over here. Let's say there are T qubits over here of uh, T. And then over here, I will get the S state, which is just the superposition of all possible states with, and this S is that omega perpendicular and omega. And then once I have this state prepared, which is just the superposition of both eigenvectors, we can apply the Grover operator raised to power two power n minus one controlled by the first qubit. And then we apply the Grover operator raised to power two power n minus two controlled by the second qubit all the way to single Grover operator controlled by the last qubit. And then over here, we have the QFT inverse. And then over here, uh, after measurements, we will be able to find theta. OK, is uh, there any question regarding the quantum counting algorithm? Okay, if not, uh, I will show you its implementation on the web that is done by these IBM people in this, uh, you know, textbook. I can share you the link. Uh, I have already shared the link, but I'll share the link for particularly for this algorithm, quantum counting. So we can just, you know, see it right there. You can see the link in the chat. Okay, so when you go there, 
you will see that okay so this is the algorithm that i was just talking about uh there's you know a little bit of uh, uh thing missing over here these t qubits that we have for this uh, uh, control operations and there are n qubits for preparing this s state for the groover operations there has to be you know uh, a few extra qubits again over here as well which would be needed to prepare you know uh these uh, oracles for these grover operators but that's a minor issue you can go through the code yourself but i'm going to show is uh, if you press on this try this will you know uh, run the uh, algorithm behind uh, on, on on their server and you can see the output right in the uh, browser Let's just run it. I want to just discuss one thing. It's simulating it and uh, okay. All right. So let's say this is the circuit that has been implemented uh, in this one. So you see there, are, this is a four qubit circuit. So there are uh, uh, a, lo a lot of these, you know, uh, Grover controlled Grover iterations. And uh, uh, you might see, okay, there are uh, several of them. For example, this first one uh, is only once. And then the second one is twice because when you have to implement U power two, all you need to do is apply U two times. And when you have to implement u power two power two, which means u power four, so you apply the Grover operator four times. And when you have to apply uh, Grover operator power two power uh, three, so that is here, you know, two power three is eight. So you have to apply Grover operator eight times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's why there's, you know, a lot of these iterations that you see. Anyway, so once you run this, you see there are only two histograms present in the output. And uh, this, this index will give us, uh, you know, uh, one value of phase and the second index will give us another value of phase. You will not be getting phase from this, you know, 0 0.494 and 0 0.504 because they correspond to CJ modulus square, which is just the, you know, amplitude of the uh, weight of the superposition of those, uh, you know, eigenvectors. The phases of the eigenvectors are going to come from this index. So this 0, 1, 0, 1 and 1, 0, 1, you know, uh, you can, for the first one, it is five and you, you know, multiply this five value with two pi and divide by two T and you can find out this phase 1.96. And once you know the phase, you can compute the number of solutions. So we have already worked out this uh, thing. So there are, you know, approximately five solutions to this sort of such problem. You see that this, this is not an exact number five instead of 4.9, because we might need more qubits to exactly, you know, uh, find this phase uh, that from where to compute the total number of solutions. So this 1.96350 is only an estimation of the actual phase theta. Uh, and you can get closer to that phase theta by increasing the number of, uh, you know, these working qubits, Q0, Q1, Q2, Q3. But of course, then you will have, have to apply many more controlled Grover operations. Okay, so any uh, questions? Okay, so in, in, in this link that I sent you, you can actually see a few other algorithms that are implemented uh, as uh, an application of quantum phase estimation, especially the Schwartz algorithm uh, that is already uh, implemented in this you know page and uh, uh, you can check it there. And if you want to see algorithms for let's say discrete logarithm or order finding a period finding, they can be found in uh, the book by Nelson and Chuang uh, those algorithms and, and the required unitary operators for them. And for all of those different algorithms, the only difference is that you change the unitary operator U to, uh, to another problem and you get, you know, another uh, algorithm uh, from point of phase estimation.
Okay, so this, uh, uh, you know, concludes the algorithm part of this course. We have one uh, session left on Monday at 5.45 p.m. Uh, in that session, I will uh, talk about uh, uh, a simple, you know, secure communication algorithm uh, based on uh, uh, quantum physics. And uh, uh, we will also, if, if there's time, we will discuss the circuit for quantum teleportation as well that uh, we couldn't do in one of the first few lectures.